All right, so we're going to finish up the criminal justice system today and uh, kind of talk about it. So we went over the laws and all the way up to felony, and I think when we left, we were talking about capital felonies. Uh, what what could um, what entails a capital felony, and we decided and, and talked about how uh, one first and foremost um, is is the biggest one is is uh, committing another felony in the course of a murder or committing a murder in another course of a felony. So if you commit murder in the act of another felony from robbery, sexual assault, burglary, you're breaking into someone's house uh, and didn't plan to have anybody be there. And someone just happens to be there and shows up and you get scared and, and you commit murder. Uh, that all falls into that same, what they call is a criminal episode. Uh, so it's the same criminal episode. Therefore, uh, that burglary, which was a, a second degree felony, just turned into capital murder because you created a murder. You, you committed a murder in the commission of that. Um, also, uh, we talked about murder of a police officer or somebody acting as a public service in the line of duty. Um, a child under the age of 10. Okay, so if you... If you are responsible for the death of a child under the age of 10, uh, that also counts as capital murder. It used to be six, and about 10 years ago, they raised the age to 10, because that's a pretty helpless age, uh, even from 10 and under. Um, one other that I can remember, I think, yeah, so I guess the only other one would be murder for remuneration. Murder for remuneration. What do you think that means? Murder for hire, okay? So hitman, someone hires a hitman. Uh, the person who hires the person can get capital murder, and the person who does the murder can get capital murder. So we had a major case in Lubbock uh, well, within the last 10 years of two doctors. I don't know if you guys remembered hearing about that. Uh, one was a doctor here in Lubbock, one was a doctor in Amarillo. The doctor in Lubbock started dating a woman. Um, they became romantically involved. Um, the doctor in Amarillo uh, decided that, uh, that was his ex-girlfriend, and decided that he didn't like her seeing this guy. Uh, I guess he thought there was some hope for something and didn't like her seeing that. So maybe uh, if this new boyfriend disappeared, she would come crying back to him. Uh, so he hired a hitman, paid him in gold bars. So he gave him a $1,200 bar of gold, uh, told him to commit it, and whenever he was done, he'd have another one for him. So $2,400 to go kill this doctor. Uh, the guy goes and does it, makes it look like a boss burglary, uh, kills the doctor here, and um, this he hired a pretty dumb guy. So it didn't take long for it to get found out. Uh, so the doctor that uh, that hired the guy, uh, the, his hitman, wasn't your normal, like you see in the movies, hitman. It was just a big, dumb, goofy guy uh, that went the very next day to a gold exchange and tried to cash in his gold bar there in, or here in Lubbock. And so it was real easy to trace it back to him. He sung like a bird, and uh, they're both in prison now. I think both of them made a plea bargain to stay out of prison and, and, and uh, agreed to life in prison without parole. So that's another benefit of having the death penalty in, in Texas especially, because one, they know we're going to use it, right? Uh, we, we use it more than any other state. We, we kill more people by lethal injection in the state of Texas than anywhere else in the civilized nation, in the civilized world, I mean. So uh, it's, it's easy to, it's not really a bluff, uh, but it works good in a plea bargain. So if somebody is guilty of one of those crimes we just talked about, or somebody has been accused of one of those crimes we talked about, um, first of all, a capital murder trial is going to be a long and drawn out trial. There's a lot of things that go into it. And in Texas, um, there is an automatic appeal at least one time. So a person can't say, I did it, go ahead and kill me, whatever else. They have to have at least one appeal. Uh, so even the appeal can take a long time. So if you try a capital murder case, that means every single word that was done on the, uh, by the court reporter is going to have to be typed all back up. And, and, uh, and uh, I, I actually was friends with the court reporter, worked a capital murder trial, um, and he sits there in the courtroom and types up every single thing that they say. Uh, but it comes out like on a little receipt in, in some kind of weird code. It's, it's just different things for different words. And it stays like that unless there's going to be an appeal. Uh, since there was an automatic appeal, he knew as soon as this was over, he needed to start typing. Uh, and he typed up um, like 20,000 pages. Of, I mean, every word that was said for every eight-hour day for 10 or 14 days is a lot of pages. Uh, and that was on his own time. So aside from his salary, he was going in the evenings and typing all that up. And I think he got $5 a page. So he ended up getting $10,000 to type up that case. So when people say, well, it's expensive to try someone for capital murder or sentence them to death, it's because just that alone, just the court reporter, uh, his job is, you know, in that particular trial, cost $10,000 just to get the actual record of it so they can send it to the appellate court and it can be appealed. 
So one of the nice things is it's plea bargains, and, and plea bargains are, are necessary. Uh, if we didn't plea people out, uh, our, our courts would be so backlogged, we wouldn't be able to keep up with it. So what percent, does everybody know what a plea bargain is? It's basically agreement to plead guilty for any sentence. Uh, some of you have done a plea bargain. If you've ever agreed to plead guilty to a ticket and not take it to trial, I mean, it'd be hard. To, what if everybody that got a ticket wanted a full trial with a jury? Yeah, so we plead guilty, right? Or no low contender, and we pay the fine. We agree to plead guilty for this fine, and then it, it doesn't go on our record. We get it, you know, deferred or something like that. Uh, all the way up to capital murder, we can plea bargain those out. Uh, so what percentage of, of crimes, especially criminal acts, do you think are plea bargained out? 90%. So about 90%. So that means only about 10% go to trial. And it can still take a year or two for someone to get to trial if they don't enter a plea bargain because it goes on the court docket and it has to go in that order. So a, speedy, a clear and speedy trial or a quick and speedy trial like the Sixth Amendment says, it's going to take a little while to get there. So the benefit of having the death penalty is we can either go through this long, drawn-out trial and have all kinds of evidence. Uh, for instance, the, uh, the, the shooter in the Texas Tech deal where he shot the officer in 2017. So next month we'll have the fourth anniversary, and he still hasn't even gotten a trial. Now, he's probably contesting it some, and he's not taking a plea bargain. Um, so based off of that, they could actually you know, keep drawing this out. Uh, and, the, and the reason it's drawing out is likely because of him. I'm sure they've been ready for trial for a couple years, uh, but they're going to throw out different things. They're going to ask for uh, discovery. They're going to uh, just all the different things that they have, the lawyers have to talk about before they actually take everything into trial. Because once we start the trial, there's not much else that we can do. So one thing that they may have been able to do to him was as a 19-year-old kid who still has a long life ahead of him, say, here's the deal. Instead of going through all this and you've just been sitting in the Lubbock County Jail waiting for your date to go to trial to see if you're guilty. And, if, and, and I'm telling you, we're going we're gonna to seek the death penalty. So if we take this to trial and they find you guilty, we're going to ask the jury to sentence you to death, to give you the lethal injection. Usually it takes on the average of about 10 years to go through all the appeals process and then kind of get on that docket and you're ordered to go. And so you could be dead by the time you're 30. So here's what we could propose. If you'll agree to plead guilty to life in prison, never have any chance of parole. Right here, you plead guilty. I understand that I'll, I'll never get out of prison uh, and I'll die in prison, but I could live to be 60, 70 if I wanted to uh, and at least try to make the best of prison. We can end this today. And the good thing about that is if they do plead guilty, if they take a plea bargain, they're, they're pleading guilty. So by pleading guilty, and the judge will remind them, you understand you don't have to plead guilty. You have your right to a, a, a day in trial, a day in court. And they say, yes, I'm, I'm sure I want to do this. Well, then another thing about this is you can never appeal this because you essentially pled guilty. And, and you say that you're not promised anything except for what's agreed to here. Uh, you understand you don't have to, yes. Okay, by doing this, you can never appeal it. So as, you, as soon as you sign on that paper and I accept it, you go to prison and we never hear from you again. Would that be a big benefit? Yeah, so that's another nice thing about the death penalty. So a lot of people that might be in disagreement with that, and that's a whole other topic we'll talk about later on in the semester, um, is, is the death penalty in itself. Some people don't agree with it. And, and just for the fact of religious beliefs or something else, uh, whatever else it may be that they don't believe in, um, it's still something that, that is talked about. So if, um, even if you don't believe in it, it's a very viable source to have here because it's a great plea bargaining tool. There's probably a lot of people that we're never going to hear from again, and they're going to end up dying in prison because um, they, they pled guilty and, and took that. So uh, they're going to do it that way. So moving on to the purpose of the criminal justice system. First of all, we definitely want to control crime, right? All the way down to speeding tickets. Why do they write speeding tickets? Incentives not to speed. Incentives not to speed. Or what happens if we speed? What's likely to happen? We might cause accidents, right? So it's, it's an effort to prevent accidents. Just like if we just kind of said, well, just keep letting them deal drugs. They'll, they'll run out or they'll just die from using drugs. Just let them do it. Just let them deal it and have all their gangs and everything else. What would end up happening? We're going to have, I mean, we already have murders because of it. Could you imagine if we just let it go and didn't try to at least intervene? There, there, we'd be like Chicago. <laughs> There'd be 70 murders a weekend of people fighting over drugs. So we have to control it the best we can. We're never going to be, have an absence of crime. Okay, that's what's great about this career. It's great that you're here because we're never going to have an absence of crime. Uh, we're always going to have crime. It'll never go away. So you have job security. 
and in the police courts or correctional fields. Our job is to try to control it the best we can and to prevent it. So how do we prevent accidents? We write tickets, right? How do we prevent Chicago? <laughs> how do we prevent all the gangs in Lubbock not shooting each other every weekend until we run out of gang members and we have 500 murders for the year? We at least try to go in and arrest them and put them in jail for the drugs before it gets worse. Same thing is, is uh, the same reason why cops will go through busy bars on the weekend and arrest people for public intoxication uh, and just kind of do them a favor because what often happens about 2.15 in the morning? One, the bar's let out, right? The bar's closed. You have a bunch of people outside. You have a bunch of intoxicated people. And then what happens? Yeah, so then we have fights. So, well, then that escalates to a stabbing or, or a shooting when if we would have just gone through at 11 o'clock and identify those people that are already doing that stuff and acting like idiots while everybody else is trying to have a good time, we can put them in jail for public intoxication, let them sleep it off and get out the next day. And we might have just saved them a murder charge by doing some intervention, by doing, um, by doing uh, effective policing, right? By, by being proactive in our policing. I hated writing tickets, but I also hated writing accidents. And it never failed on the evening shift. When I went in at 3 o'clock, by 3.10, I'd have an accident to work. And it's July, and it's 110 degrees, and I'm wearing all this gear. And now for the rest of the day, I'm sweaty and stinky. I can't dry off. So my day is ruined. Now I just feel like, I'm, I'm, like I just worked out of the gym times 10, and i got to walk around in it all day. Well, how do I prevent that? Get out of your air conditioner for two minutes, ride them a ticket, get back in your air conditioner, and maybe that person goes, dang it, I need to start slowing down. I really need to pay attention. This is going to hopefully teach me a lesson to do that. So to control crime, to prevent crime, and to provide and maintain justice, right? We have to, to try to make it as equal as possible. We have to, uh, we have to afford people their 5th and 14th right, uh, Amendment right by the 15th, 4th, 5th and 14th Amendment, which is a right to due process, uh, because that is the law of the land. That's something that we have to ensure that people have. They have their right to be heard. Uh, we can't just say, well, we think you did this, and I don't care what you say, we're just going to put you in prison, right? We have a trial. We have all kinds of different avenues to have the right to be heard. So we have the right to provide and maintain justice. And by maintaining justice, it's also maintaining people's rights. By not abusing people, by, by, by not having excessive force amongst police officers, uh, to make sure and, and, and that the good, the good people in our communities feel safe because we're at least going out there and trying. Uh, we're trying to get criminals. They're still going to have crime. People are still going to occasionally get their houses broken into. But if we didn't go out there and try at least, it would be a, a burglary a thon every weekend and while well, everybody else is shooting each other because it's a drug thon and everybody gets to do what they want. So it's about maintaining a balance. And if you think of the, if you think of the, um, the lady justice and the scales of justice, we just got to make sure they're not doing this. We got to try to balance them out as best as we can. So we have to be, maintain law and order, but at the same time, we have to uphold the rights of our citizens. And that's what a lot of people are fighting and arguing about right now is they, they don't think that their rights are being afforded. And in some cases, they have an argument. Uh, some cases, maybe they just don't really understand what the law is or what they are required to do as citizens to be able to not have to worry about that and go about your business. So to be able to provide and maintain that justice. So another part that we talk about is a dark figure of crime. Okay, So this is really interesting to find out about crimes and, and why we have crimes and, and, and how we learn them. Okay, So if there's a crime, there's really only one way for anything to be handled, and that's what? If a crime is committed... How do we make sure something might happen with it? Someone has to report it. So do they call the district attorney and say, hey, uh, someone broke into my house, so I want you to prosecute this guy because I know who it is. Who do they call? They call the police. The only way you can get into the criminal justice system is the police. So the police is the, are the start of the whole thing. So you have to call the police to even report it first, and then it goes from there. So those are the crimes known to the police because someone called us, because someone made us aware, hey, this happened to me. Then there's a dark figure of crime, of stuff that people just didn't report. Has anybody ever had something happen to them or their property that they just go, eh, what's the use, and didn't report it? Like what? Give me an example. Had your house broken into. You didn't, you didn't call? No? Just thought, well, did they get anything? I just told you. I had a call on that one. Okay, so yeah, bike, well... And call the police, go through all this, what are my chances of getting it back, or I can go spend 100 bucks and get another bike. Or, my, yeah, well, I just looked down the street and 15 other people got their mailboxes knocked off, so I'll just go buy another one. It's not worth it. It'll take me longer to call the police, wait for them to come, 
uh, or if you're in Lubbock, self-reporting it and going online and, and, and maybe having a self